Well, good morning, and uh, appreciate the stalwart hanging in there. Um, and thanks to Julio and uh, colleagues for the opportunity to, uh, to present this work on behalf of my co-investigators and colleagues listed here. Um, it, it's going to be a fairly brief presentation because it's relatively recently funded, so we don't have data yet. But um, the funding has come from the National Institute of Drug Abuse in the second round of their Seek, Test, Treat, and Retain vulnerable population funding cycle. So uh, even in a place like Kenya, which has obviously a mature and generalized epidemic, um, there is a growing contribution of uh, parental transmission related to substance use uh, in, in, um, in terms of the HIV epidemic. Um, injecting drug use has been reported uh, for a number of years um, in the majority of, of uh, Sub-Saharan African countries, um, and there is some likelihood that, that the, there may be overlap between the uh, sexual and injecting um, networks, um, so that's another concern. Uh, Heroin has been available in the region for some time, including white heroin with its, with its easier transmissibility. Um, Ken, places like Kenya are actually on the trade route from South Asia up through Europe. So there's both increasing flow of drugs as well as, as um, uh, utilization of it in, in country. So regional workshops that have been held have pointed out kind of some of the uh, characteristics of the, the Epidemic, epidemics involving injectors, um, more concentrated in a place like Mauritius, which actually was one of the first countries in, in uh, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa to um, engage in a needle syringe program, and a bit more mixed and generalized in places like Kenya. Um, there have been high levels of uh, risky practices noted, including flash blood, which uh, Dr. Volko has pointed out is one of the most efficient ways to transmit HIV. That's the practice of injecting the blood of your colleague who has injected drugs. And this is all really happening in the context of almost non-existent both addiction treatment, uh, evidence-based addiction treatment, um, as well as uh, needle syringe programs. So you can see from the, um, the top map, uh, the, the gray and uh, colors, um, there's either uh, not much data available um, or just the black and, and dark gray, um, no needle syringe programs available whatsoever, or uh, a few scattered programs, but no uh, coverage um, of levels available. Um, also, opioid substitution therapy has likewise not been very available. The dark red here is where um, OST is, uh, methadone has essentially been outlawed. So let me describe to you our, our research setting. This is a, a community-based trial taking place in Nairobi and coastal Kenya, which is really where the preponderance of people who inject drugs in Kenya are. And Kenya, uh, the government has now committed to doing a, an evidence-based needle syringe program using global fund money. So that's very encouraging. Um, the, and they also, uh, the national program uh, has uh, really included now uh, people who inject drugs as an at-risk population. They've been included with some funding in the national um, HIV strategy plans for the last two years. And so now that this needle syringe program is gonna roll out nationally, we have this opportunity to integrate a rigorous uh, evaluation design. So just to try to get a sense, a handle on the denominators, which is a problem, um, it is a very hidden uh, population, as you can imagine, in Kenya. Some of the earlier estimates of the number of uh, injecting drug users uh, were probably ranging on the high side. Uh, more recent estimates are probably closer uh, and are aligning to some uh, recent uh, um, respondent-driven sampling surveys that have been done in uh, Nairobi by Pop Council, and another one that's underway currently on the coast. So we'll see, but it may be around closer to 30,000 um, injecting drug users. However, in the national surveillance system, it's been noted that uh, almost 19% of incident infections on the coast, uh, and a not insubstantial portion of national uh, incidents is being attributed to um, injecting drug use. Stephanie Strathy, who's working with us on this, on this study as well, has estimated that, uh, along with Tim Hallett, have modeled that if there was a good, really good coverage level of needle syringe program services, it could result in a dramatic reduction uh, in incidents, uh, uh, incident infections related to injecting drug use. So what are our elements of the STTR cascade? We're gonna be using respondent-driven sampling to find uh, IDUs. We're offering rapid HIV testing. That'll be part of the NSP uh, service uh, program, which at this point is, they're planning to roll that out at 10 sites. We're gonna offer point of care uh, CD4 assay for those people who test HIV positive. And if they are at three, below 350, we would then offer a pure case manager and provide small amounts of conditional cash transfers 
to both the case manager and the participant uh, for linking that person to care. So we're going to do this by using a step wedge cluster randomized design, and I'll, I'll show that in, in a minute. We will also are building in mathematical modeling to estimate community viral load in the injecting and, uh, networks and potential population level impact, and we'll assess the incremental cost effectiveness ratio of this approach. So description of the intervention, the, the government sponsored uh, program will sort of try to incorporate as many of the nine WHO uh, elements, uh, recommended elements as possible. They are talking about prioritizing treatment slots for those uh, uh, below 350. Actually, the treatment thresholds have now changed in the new Kenya um, HIV guidelines to 350. Uh, the study will additionally be collecting behavioral data. We'll be adding um, the, the viral load testing so that we can uh, come up with that estimate of community viral load impact. We're adding to the point of care CD4 um, and the peer case managers and behavioral economics piece. Um, we are using RDS for this, uh, and we're going to be collecting data in six time waves, both pre-intervention uh, of the national program rollout and then five waves of data capture over time. Uh, our, our estimates at this point are that we will probably be screening up to 10,000 injecting drug users. Our goal is to get at least 1,800 um, viral loads by the end of the study, um, and that will give us power to look at some of the outcomes that are of interest. We know that some of the same injecting drug users will probably be captured over the different time waves. So we're actually using uh, fingerprint biometrics in real time connected to a server in the U.S. to ensure that we don't enroll the same injecting drug user um, more than once in the same time wave and to be able to just track the, the, um, uh, the uh, enrollment over time. And then our statistical methods will take uh, the non-dependent data, in, uh, independent data into, into account. We're using a stepped wedge design, and so what this is, is um, we will be able to, we cannot obviously randomize, you know, uh, which sites would get a needle syringe program, which, would, which wouldn't, but we, what we are able to randomize is the start order of when these 10 sites will roll out with their services, so that when one collects baseline um, time data, which is on the left, uh, and then the other blank cells are where we collect uh, basically control time, for places, for the sites where the program hasn't yet rolled out, the green is where the site, the, the program has rolled out, and that's essentially intervention time. So one is able to compare control and intervention time in a, random, in a randomized way. We're collecting uh, behavioral data on uh, computer-assisted um, staff-administered uh, interviews on tablet computers, looking at these basic elements, um, and including in these elements some standardized scales and items that, are, that have been promulgated by NIDA across the two rounds of their funding um, uh, partner of, 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 the, of the studies. So um, I, I got this from Madonna Chandler. If you have any questions about the NIDA har data harmonization effort, you can ask her more about it. But the idea is that across these studies that are all doing STTR with vulnerable populations and with correctional populations in the, in the U.S. and elsewhere, you know, can we use some of the same items so that we could pool data and get a little more bang for the buck, basically. Just to give you sort of a flavor of it, uh, across different domains in people's surveys, can we capture some of the same, um, same elements using the same uh, constructs and, and items? And I think the next step that we're, we're, we're proposing to do, and again, kind of following the work of our colleagues, um, Opley Das and others in, in San Francisco, and now also leveraging the Institute of Medicine report that came out just uh, last month about tracking HIV care in the U.S. to kind of give ourselves a seek, test, treat, and retain cascade. What are the overall um, outcomes that we all want to track across our studies? Obviously, uh, it has been mentioned once or twice, WHO is going to be promulgating some program level STTR um, recommended tracking metrics, and those will probably come out as an interim guidance, hopefully the, in by September or so, but will certainly be integrated in next year's uh, 2013 um, treatment guidelines. But in the meantime, I guess I would just urge those of us who are trying to do STTR studies, can we come up with some consensus around what pieces we want to test how, and the definitions that we use um, to constitute testing uptake, um, you know, how successfully we're, we're getting people into, into linking to care, what do we consider engagement, what do we consider retention, and then what is the ultimate um, uh, distal outcome. Um, obviously, for those of us who are involved in studies with shorter time periods, we probably can't look at mortality, but we can look at perhaps morbidity. 
um, and, and uh, proportion who were at least uh, on, on ART and undetectable. So these are just some potential overarching STTR study metrics that we'll be considering. So just back to my study quickly, um, this is kind of the study flow again, just to, to rehash. We'll be uh, enrolling people from the, the program sites with study staff, um, consenting, doing the survey, testing, and then for those positives, doing the PEMA point of care, CD4, and um, seeing if they are eligible for both uh, treatment as currently defined um, in Kenya and a peer case manager. We're interested primarily in the linkage to care piece, the time to ART treatment, we'd censor for those who don't initiate. And then as I say, our primary outcome is this idea of community viral load. We know there's pros and cons to, um, to this as, as a measure, um, but, but our goal is to be able to randomly capture from each of the 10 sites during the time waves uh, amongst people who've HIV tested at least nine months ago, because we presume they've had to have had time to um, potentially get into care and have an impact, intervention impact. Um, we would then uh, pick up those viral loads so that by the end, we'd have sufficient power to be able to say whether there's been some change in viral load over time and a uh, proportion of undetectable uh, pre and post. And we are using DBS to capture viral loads, which certainly um, uh, simplifies the field uh, field data capture. The modeling will be uh, estimating the viral load and potential um, le population level impact of the, the, uh, the uh, intervention. And we're working with Scott Braithwaite, uh, who's here in the audience from NYU, who has some existing models that have been tested in Sub-Saharan Africa now to incorporate the injecting drug use um, characteristics. And we would be looking at the potential cost effectiveness of the program uh, from a national perspective and also look at operational issues that are, are relevant in, in the context, as we've been discussing here, of government programs and other uh, programs that have to make alternative decisions about available and scarce resources. So those of, if anybody's done a step wedge design, I'd love to talk to you because they're, they're certainly not easy to do. Um, they offer some um, uh, theoretical uh, advantages in context where you can't do a, a traditional uh, randomized control trial, but it's not easy. So for example, temporal changes, there's a, some other funding sources that are coming in, and the same implementers that will work with the government um, NSP program are ready to start doing the program now. We're actually, we've, we've, um, we've created a community advisory board, we've hired our staff, we have IRB approval, we're training our staff next week to do the baseline data capture, and we'll start that in two weeks. But in the meantime, if people start, if, if program implementers are starting to do some elements of needle syringe, obviously it sort of um, can muddy the, 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 uh, the, the clarity of, of the context in which the, the study is taking place. On the other hand, of course, you know, there obviously is a huge ethical need for um, injecting drug users to have access to these services. The NGOs themselves have to start working and, and get their funding and keep their staff going. So um, it, it's a bit difficult to keep the timing together on, on something like this when one tries to integrate a rigorous uh, research design into what needs to be ongoing program uh, implementation. So um, those are open questions, but we hope that we end up at, at the end of this with at least some information um, as with Swaziland's um, uh, 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 study around TASP that can provide some guidance um, in the region and lessons learned. And just thank you to our funders and to our colleagues. <laughs>